today is uh, Dr. Mukesh Aghi. He is the president and CEO of the India-US Strategic Partnership Forum. He interacts very closely with key policymakers, officials, and CEOs from India and the US and works very hard to promote trade between India and the US and ties in general between the two countries. Dr. Aghi, how have you been? Welcome very to well. Delhi. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure. So how was your visit to Gujarat for the vibrant uh, Gujarat Global Summit? Oh, it was excellent. You have to understand it's no longer a vibrant Gujarat, I would say it's vibrant India. Mm -hmm. uh, the sense of energy, the optimism, uh, sense of purpose looking towards 2047 uh, defines the excitement about the country and also opportunity for international investors to come into the country and be part of the growth story. Absolutely. So what is the momentum that you are carrying from here, from the Davos of the East? to the Davos of the West, if I may characterize it like that, because you'll be headed to the World Economic Forum in Davos. Well, I think the message is, is don't miss India as an opportunity to the investors. You have to look at the last 10 years. India on the public market generated almost 22% CAGR, whereas when you look at compared to China, it was 0%. So India is a tremendous opportunity for investors, that's one. Two is, is on an FDI perspective. There's no other country which is offering more opportunity, ease of doing business, and sense of growth. You have a $4 trillion economy growing 7%. It'll become $5 trillion in the next couple of years. And the sense of purpose is it'll become $10 trillion. So I think if you don't jump in the bandwagon now, you will miss the opportunity. You were there, I think, uh, in the United States uh, when the Prime Minister was there on a state visit uh, in 2023. And what a historic visit that was with so many firsts. How was his interaction with the American investors there? And are they really bullish about India? What can you tell us about the interactions that happened? Because I remember his, him saying that the batting pitch is now ready. It's been laid out for you now. Come and bat. No, absolutely. I think You have to understand, uh, this Prime Minister connects well with people and he connects better with business leaders. Uh, he's able to understand what they're looking for. And there's nothing wrong when an investor says, I want to come and make profit. He says, come, make profit, but create jobs, bring in technology. And his message to US CEOs was, market is open, it's up to you. Whoever can come in and pitch their tent first will grab the uh, bigger market share. So I think he was very open, transparent, and welcoming to these investors. And what an outcome-oriented visit that was. Uh, look at the investments by Micron Technologies, how GE has come into the picture. So all in all, uh, what did the investors feel about the visit and are they really looking forward to do much more going forward? So I think you have to understand uh, this was one of the best visit of any Indian Prime Minister. You, ha you have to understand from a, a relationship perspective uh, from G to G, President Biden and Prime Minister Modi got along very well. They signed almost 107 different agreements, all the way from cooperation in space to uh, quantum computing to artificial intelligence. We have, for the first time, U.S. has allowed G engine to be manufactured outside the United States. So India was the fourth country in the world to manufacture hot jet engines. So that's a tremendous development. We are cooperating in the space. I think both countries are looking at how do we send uh, basically people uh, to the moon itself together. So I think there is a lot of energy. There's a lot of uh, synergy. And you have uh, I call geopolitical alignment between the two countries to drive that. But then one more thing beside the investors. You have 5 million Indian Americans in the US. They make 1.5% of the population of US, but they generate 6% of GDP. So the economic strength, the intellectual strength, their participation in the political process is, is outweighing any other minority group. That also sends a message of strong partnership between the two countries. And there are so many futuristic sectors that you spoke of, and space is one of them, semiconductors is another. We know that the ease of doing business is improving, but these are new sectors, futuristic sectors. So do they need some sort of a hand-holding from the Indian side? What is it that they're looking forward to? Well, I think uh, when you say ease of doing business, uh, you can't just put India in one basket. You know, India has many states, and every state tends to operate differently because you have, it's a democracy. You have opposition in those states also, and, and, and that's healthy opposition. So, you know, investors are saying that 
we want to be able to easily come in, invest, create our organization, create the uh, capital return, and, and be able to contribute to the local society, but also be able to export to the rest of the world. So depending on which state, so let the states compete among themselves and let them become more competitive with each other itself. So I think ease of business is getting better, but you have to measure it by state by state. Some states are much better than the others, and we are seeing investors going to the states where things are much easier also. So I think India is opening up, yes, we have to make more progress. I think there's a momentum and you'll see more progress. And has the perception changed of these investors towards India in the last 10 years or so? Uh, absolutely. I think you have to understand the couple of factors. One is you have this government which is making a lot of effort to open up the market, to make things easier for the investors to come in. Then you have the pressure of China. Uh, companies are looking at China as an alternative destination from China. They're getting harassed in China. And India provides that opportunity for them to come and set up manufacturing and also basically go after the domestic market. So it's a win-win for investors, it's a win-win for India, and we see the momentum picking up quite aggressively. When you speak to the investors in the U.S., do they tell you about their plans to shift their manufacturing bases and the supply chains from China to India? We've seen Apple doing uh, some uh, of that uh, in the past. Do you see more and more companies wanting to go that way? Yeah, we are seeing a substantial number of companies, but they are reluctant to make that announcement because the moment they make the announcement, they get harassed in China. So they are quietly moving a lot of stuff. I must be working with almost 200 companies looking at alternative to China, and India becomes the preferred side. Hmm, so India is the preferred uh, side. Now, uh, talks have taken place here in New Delhi between Catherine Tai, the U.S. Trade Representative, and India's Commerce Minister, Piyush Goyal. There's a lot of expectations on the trade side, particularly since Donald Trump was in power, the GSP status was withdrawn uh, from India. And uh, there have been endless talks to get them back. And I think there is some assurance that uh, has come in from Catherine Tai saying that we are open to looking at India's concerns. What is it that one can expect on a practical basis? And what is it that you would want? What is your wish list? Well, you have to understand uh, GSP was a preference treatment to small exporters. Without GSP uh, benefit, the fastest growing exports to the United States from India is the same goods in GSP category. Now, if you get the benefit back, which is fine. If you don't get it back also, you are seeing acceleration of those exports. It's a complex process. You have to go back to the Congress to get the approval. You have elections coming this year. You have, within the Congress, people are against any trade deals happening. So I think it will be challenging getting GSP back this year. It may happen after the election, but this year I think, and I could be wrong, uh, it will be difficult. And if I remember it correctly, the trade target that was announced some years back between India and the U.S. was $500 billion. What is the big picture in terms of trade that you see in this relationship going forward? So I think when you look at trade, it has crossed now $200 billion. So we are seeing momentum. Uh, we are opening up markets for the American goods to come in. America is opening a market for Indian goods to come in. So that momentum continues. And as when you look at when the Indian economy is growing 7%, 8%, its demand will go up, its purchasing power will go up, and you will see more and more trade happening between the two countries. I think our biggest challenge is crude trade, because we import 80% of our oil. We need to find alternative to that to be able to manage. But I think the trade between India and the U.S. will go up and up. That's how I see it. So let me ask you uh, five challenges and five opportunities in the overall investment, business, and trade <laughs> partnership between India and the U.S. I think the opportunity for U.S. and India is tremendous. And I'm not just talking purely from an old technology. We are cooperating on quantum. We're cooperating on AR. We're cooperating on cybersecurity. We're looking at space. We're seeing a lot of uh, Indian space startups. We're working with them to come to the United States itself. So that momentum also continues. So I think uh, opportunities are limitless. 
challenges, I think we'll have to deal with the global geopolitics uh, because that becomes challenges. But there's enough maturity. You know, for example, India decided it'll continue buying Russian oil because it is in the interest of India itself. U.S. understood that issue and they respected that. And India continued. Now, recent strike in Yemen on the Houthis, India's challenge is to make sure that the Arabian Sea, the Red Sea, is open because it has an impact on our exports itself. It is because almost 15 percent of the global exports go through the Red Sea. It is in trust of the European and Americans to keep the Red Sea open. So India did not participate in the joint patrolling and joint strikes itself. But America respects that. So I think you'll have geopolitical challenge. Then I think you'll have to deal with, uh, I call the isolated cases, Panun and others, where uh, you know there are accusations that India was involved. But I think let the law continue with this process. But again, there's enough maturity that that has been kind of sandboxed into one area while the trade continues, while the cooperation takes place. So I think you will have challenges, but I strongly believe there's enough maturity on both sides, enough geopolitical interest on both sides to ensure that this does not get railroaded in a different direction. So Dr. Aghi, this is the new year, and new year is known for resolutions. What is the resolution that you would want India and the US to take in the new year? I, I think uh, there's a lot uh, both can work on. Uh, I think one of the resolutions I wish we can do and execute is get India as a permanent member of the Security Council. I think India has that seat, it deserves that seat, and I think it's important that if you want India to be a global player in an effective manner, then it's important that India gets that seat this year. Pleasure, Dr. Aghi, speaking to you. Thank you, my pleasure.